I am Hilary from Soul Machines, and that was a really fascinating talk by Janelle. And so now I want to talk to you a little bit about how we're able to harness the weirdness of AI. Um, and what we're looking to do is talk to you this morning about how your brands need to adapt to survive in the face of the fourth industrial revolution that is, that is rapidly coming upon us. So if you've had a chance to read the quote here by Maya Angelou, people buy from people. We know this. This human connection that we crave and that we need is hardwired into us as human beings. It just is. So if you think about it, and I won't ask you to put your hands up, but in the room, I'm guessing that you've got at least one impractical thing at home that you bought because you fell in love with the process of buying it. You were in love with the brand. It could be a car. It could be a bike. In my case, it could be a handbag. There are lots of different examples of where our feelings have driven what it is that we buy and what it is that we attach to. If you think back in various uh, business contexts, there may be a sales engagement that you were involved in. There may be a business meeting that you were involved in where you had a really, really great experience and you remember that. There may be the converse of that. There may be a very negative experience that you had. And again, you remember that because you remember how that experience made you feel. Now, whether it's because the millennials are to blame, whether it's because we've got social media, whatever it is, we now expect brands to, and businesses to be human whenever and wherever they touch us. We want that connection to the brand 24-7. We want them to understand what we want. We want them to understand when we want it. And we want to feel like we're valued, that we're a customer, that you know what we want, that you're, I'm, I'm valuable to you as a business. However, as businesses are struggling to scale, to meet these requirements, to meet these needs by the customers, it's actually going the other way around. We're finding that it's almost becoming robotic. How many times has, say, your wife borrowed your laptop and searched for something, shoes or something, and the next time you use your laptop, all of a sudden you're spammed with advertising for handbags? Or your teenage son is looking up new surfboards or skateboards, and now all of a sudden you are seeing advertising for surfboards or skateboards. That's not relevant to you. That's not contextual to you and what you want. But it's the way that businesses are having to try and adapt. It's by just doing this automation and the scale, but it's purely automated, then it becomes robotic, and it doesn't feel human. It doesn't feel like it's tailored to me. Now, some of you may or may not be aware of any one of the three people on the screen. So if we start on the left-hand side with little Michaela. So she is, believe it or not, not a real person. She is an Instagram model and musician. So she doesn't exist in real life. She's a creation of, of a brand, as it were. But she has had interviews with Vogue magazine. She was given a fashion show, obviously virtual, with Prada um, at the Milan Fashion Show. So she's got 1.5 million followers. She is a real brand. But I can't connect to her. I can't talk to her. I can't have any kind of real connection with her. But she has a great following on Instagram. I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with Tupac Shakur and a big fan of his music. Even if you weren't, a couple of years ago he was in concert, even though he passed away, gosh, must be a decade or maybe longer now. So he was in concert as a holograph. Now what that meant is his fans could go to this concert, they could sit in the audience and they could watch him as he performed his hit songs. They couldn't engage with him, they couldn't make eye contact with him. It was like watching a TV show, but still they were able to kind of get up close and personal with, without the personal part with one of their idols. And then how many of you guys watch Westworld? I'm sure there's, yep. Okay, so you're probably familiar with the premise of Westworld where humans are able to engage, for better or for worse, with these robots in the real world. However, none of this is available in the real world. You can't actually interact with these robots uh, that look like humans, that feel like humans, that talk like humans? Or can you? So these are the questions that we at Soul Machines think about. These are the questions that drive what it is that we do. What if we made it easier for humans to interact with machines? As we move into this fourth industrial revolution, as we face some of the challenges that Janelle raised earlier around, around AI, it is critically important that humans build trust with computers. As we're going to scale out and grow, as I say in, this, in the fourth industrial revolution, we need to have this trust between 
humans and computers. So what if the answer to all of these questions was designing a human operating system for artificial intelligence, which is, oddly enough, exactly what we do and have done and are building at Soul Machines. So I'm gonna show you a quick video now, just to give you a little bit of a feel about what we're actually doing and to see some of our artificial humans. So I can't introduce you to an artificial human right now, but if you come and see me afterwards in the break, um, I can introduce you to one of our artificial humans. But take a look, see if you can tell the difference between our Soul Machine staff and some of our customers and our artificial humans. Welcome to Soul Machines, the world of digital humans. In an era of AI, robots and machines, what we're focusing on is making those machines more human-like. Literally, we're putting a face on artificial intelligence. What happens if you truly wanted to build a character which could animate itself? The only way to do that is to give it a brain. You've always imagined computers being more human. Now we are. The next employee you recruit could be digital. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Fatima. I'm Jamie. Hi, I'm Will. I'm Cora. I'm here to help you with your top questions about your bank accounts. We're partnering with Soul Machines. Creating incredibly lifelike, emotionally responsive digital humans with personality and character that allow machines to talk to us literally face to face. And they have some very interesting technology around digital assistance. Have you already downloaded your product? Yes, I have. You are already one step ahead. What we love about Soul Machines is that they're really interested in understanding human consciousness and interaction and engagement. And the whole purpose is really to investigate, to explore the role that digital humans can play in improving the customer experience. It was like talking to a real person. You look anxious, but rest assured your health is my primary concern. The opportunity with digital health professionals like what we're doing with Soul Machines is to be able to deliver more care to more patients for less cost. The opportunities are literally endless, so it's an incredibly creative endeavor. Welcome to Mercedes-Benz. I'm here to help you with your new car. We can make realistic people, but they could be realistic creatures. They could be cartoon characters. Oh, there you are. Welcome to my party. But they're all driven by a nervous system, so that everything they do is related to what the person's doing that's interacting with them. Soul Machines uses neural networks to give me a virtual nervous system so I can learn and react in real time. It is a very compelling method to deliver new information. We're shaping the future through digital learning. I, for one, have a lot of hope in this technology as a means to deliver cost-effective, rich experiences into the future. And in a world first, we are tweaking the digital DNA to create millions of customized artificial humans, taking our technology to the next level. The future is round the corner. Let us take you there. What I love about that when I watch that is just watching people's reactions when they interact with an artificial human. Because sometimes when people first see one, they may go, oh, I'm not sure about that. Is it going to be weird? So the answer to that is just talk to one. And you saw particularly in the Air New Zealand video, people started talking to her. And then they were laughing. They were getting excited. That's the kind of brand engagement that you want. That's the kind of customer connection that you want. Because I guarantee you that lady in that video still remembers that experience today. She still remembers how she felt when she was engaging with our artificial human. And at the end of the day, Air New Zealand, in her mind, will be a positive association for their brand. Uh, and for her, she got to, in this case, she got to do something cool. But we want to do more than just cool experiences like that. We want to work with businesses so that we can give them their own digital employees that can help you on a daily basis, 24-7, scale out, uh, reach your customers, and give you that kind of emotional connection and reaction that you just saw. Now, the great thing about speaking before Greg is that I get to steal one of his favorite quotes. So the chief economist at Google, Hal Varian, talks about the fact that you can predict the future by what the wealthy have today. So if you think about it for a minute, wealthy people generally have personal bankers. So I can go and I can talk, well, not that wealthy, but say I had a personal banker, I could go and talk to them and they would give me very specialized knowledge. It would be very personalized and tailored to me because I am their client, they know all of my background, they know all of my financial situation and they're tailoring this to me. But what about the people that don't have access to personal bankers, people that don't have as much money, don't understand wealth management? They're probably the ones that need these personal bankers more than the people that have already amassed a lot of wealth. 
Same goes for, for education. If you think about students, you think about the ones that have wealthy parents, if they're struggling in school, they can generally get tutors. Tutors can help them figure out what it is they need to learn, teach them that so they can be successful at school. What if the next Bill Gates is out there, the next Steve Jobs is out there, and they don't have access to some of this education and personal tutelage? Perhaps they're not able to, to reach their full potential that they could have been. If you were to have an artificial human like you saw in our video, we can scale out these kinds of things. We can scale out this personalized interaction and this specialized knowledge to enable people, poorer people, students that don't have access to great teachers, people in different parts of the country that perhaps don't have the, the, the types of schools that we have in the cities, they will then be able to reap the benefits uh, that the wealthy have today. So there's three ways that we look about implementing what we're talking about here. And Greg and I, between us, will we'll talk through some of these in the next few minutes. So we talk about the human operating system, and this is how our artificial humans are able to engage with humans in such a human-like way. So how do our artificial humans know to smile in return when somebody smiles at them? How do they know to look sympathetic if you're looking confused when, when they've answered a question for you? that works in exactly the same way that it works for us as humans. So you saw in the video that we've created uh, a digital brain. Now this digital brain is based on bi biologically inspired models of the human brain. So when I look at you, if I smile at you, smile at you now, you smile back at me because you are hardwired biologically to do that unless you choose to override that. So when I smile at you, it releases oxytocin and dopamine into your brain, which then, when they're released, they trigger your facial nerves to respond in a smile. So in order to have our artificial humans be able to autonomously respond to you, we built them a digital brain. In this digital brain, when a customer smiles at them, it releases virtual dopamine, virtual oxytocin, which then moves through their system, triggers their virtual facial nerves, and gets them to smile. When they're speaking at you, to, to you because they have virtual lungs, this is the way that we talk. I breathe in, I breathe out to talk. Our artificial humans work the same way, which is really kind of cool. In terms of a brand perspective, this enables us to deliver a new approach. We talked at the beginning about everybody is wanting this personal connection, everybody is wanting brands to treat them as human, but we're just not getting there. We're getting automation, we're getting scale, we're getting this robotic-like feel. However, through this artificial human that we have, we're able to allow for actual interaction. You're able to have this two-way conversation with the artificial human, which is a direct representation of your brand, who has been trained in your brand, trained in the way that you want them to, to come across. So you're communicating. It's contextual. It's based on what you want to talk about at the time that you want to talk to, you, to them about it. It can have as much information about you as you choose to share, or as you as the brand already know about the existing interactions with this particular customer. And as you saw in the video, it's human-like. Our artificial humans look hyper real because we've spent a lot of time building out the full high fidelity rendering, and they are also reacting in this human-like way to you. You smile, they smile back. You look confused, they look sympathetic. Their sole purpose in life, and it's why it makes me happy when I interact with them, is to make me happy. They want to keep me happy, they want to figure out what my problem is and they want to solve it. Which, at the end of that um, interaction, if I'm happy, my association with the brand that I'm talking to that's represented by this artificial human wins as well. So small and medium businesses in particular can struggle to grow as they just can't scale fast enough. You want to be available 24-7. You want to offer customer service all the time but you can't because you just don't have the resources and therefore you can't employ more people. So what if you were to augment your existing workforce with digital humans? These digital humans allow you to scale. They are available 24-7. And what's more, they do the jobs that humans don't want to do. If we look at customer service um, call centers, for example, the attrition rate in that is around 70%. It's a crap job. Nobody wants to do it. They have to answer the same questions over and over again. Digital human, if we look at Leah there, she doesn't care. Every time she answers that question, she's happy to do it. She's representing the brand exactly as she's been trained. She doesn't have a bad day. She's there to make your customers feel happy. And she's there, as I said, to take on 
the jobs that humans don't want to do and able to elevate humans to maybe tier two in the call center so they can start to answer the, the really complex conversations or the, the questions that you really do need to have a real human address. What's more, if they sense, say um, Leah here, if she senses that a customer's confused or reacting negatively, she can adapt the conversation. So she can go, okay, do you understand that? Is this making sense? And really make sure that the customer is getting the value that they need from that conversation. From all of this as well, customers or the brands themselves can get a whole lot of what we call EQ data. So they can see at what parts of the conversation customers are reacting positively. We can see when they're reacting negatively or they're looking confused. And that allows the brands to then tailor their messaging so that the next time a customer talks to the artificial human, the script and the branding and the positioning can be tailored, can be tailored to that based on the results that we've seen from the previous interactions. Now, what we're seeing with our customers, the customers that are moving forward are the innovators, the disruptors. They're the ones that understand it, as we heard Janelle talking about before. Data is key when it comes to artificial intelligence. The more data you have, the more value you have. So the customers that start early, the customers that understand and embrace this, are the ones that are going to be collecting all of this EQ data about their customers, and their competitors will not be able to catch up because it's exponential. So imagine if you've got all of this information about your customers, you're able to tailor your conversations to them, and your competitors don't have that information. I know which camp I personally would rather be in. It doesn't just have to be for customer service. If we look at celebrities, if we look at sports people, they are, in fact, a brand. They're a, a walking, personified brand. So it's opening the doors to them to be able to engage with their, their fans on a one-to-one -one basis. So at the moment, we can go on Instagram, we can go on Twitter, we can see what the celebrities are putting out there for us. If we're really lucky and we say something, they might, they might like it. They might maybe um, put a little comment underneath what we've said as well. But it's not that, that personal connection uh, that, that we all crave. So if we were to to make an artificial human out of a celebrity. They could then be available 24 seven. They could potentially monetize it if they want. They could put it behind the paywall, et cetera. So it doesn't just have to be customer service. It's about scaling out all forms of communications. So if we go back to the start, when we talked about little Michaela and Tupac, imagine if little Michaela for, for her 1.5 million followers, bringing her to life, having a conversation with her, understanding more about her. The Tupac one, now that really interests me. In a few years' time, wouldn't it be cool if we could go to a concert, Tupac or Elvis or whatever icon that, that we want can be on stage doing a concert. He can make eye contact with you. You can kind of get a little bit of a buzz because he's made eye contact with you. You're interacting with him. He can change his style of the performance based on the feedback he's getting from the audience. That's super engaging, and that's a lot more interesting than just watching this pre-recorded content. And why does it just have to be around, around people and around brands? What about the products themselves? What if we look to humanize these products? If we think about the advent and the rise of electric cars, that's going to be pretty disruptive for the existing dealer networks of a lot of car dealerships, because we all know electric cars don't require as much maintenance and servicing as traditional cars. So car manufacturers are going to need to find new ways to succeed new ways to move forward in the face of all of this. So Mercedes-Benz, um, they were one of our first customers and now one of, our, one of our big investors. They're looking at ways into the future. What if we could have a concierge in the car? It, it might just be me, but sometimes I get into my car and there's a random icon flashing on the dashboard. I don't know what it means. I have to go generally get onto my phone, go onto Google, look it up, figure out what I need to do. What if I had an in-car concierge who could tell me, your service is due. Hey, that indicator light that you've been ignoring for the last three weeks, it's getting pretty serious now. In fact, this is what it means, and here's how you can fix it. Do you want me to go ahead and get that service booked in for you? Those sorts of things. Those are the kind of futures that we're dreaming of, and personally, as a car person, that makes me pretty excited. Now, the numbers that we're seeing means that all of this matters, this face-to-face -face connection matters. And the data is showing us this that human connection is really, really important. In fact, I'm not going to read out all the numbers, you can read them yourselves, but you can see the 93% there. Accenture found that 93% that of communication effectiveness comes from nonverbal cues. So if I'm interacting with a traditional chatbot, 
I can't get these nonverbal cues. I can't see the body language. I can't understand if the customer that I'm talking to is responding positively to me, responding negatively to me. In fact, Autodesk, one of our customers, you saw an interview uh, in, in the video there, Autodesk released a standard traditional chatbot because they wanted to reach their customers, they wanted to scale out uh, their communications. And that was good in one sense, but interestingly, their customer satisfaction scores decreased. Because if we go back to the beginning, when we talked about the fact that everything's becoming more robotic, everything's becoming more abstracted away from that human connection. So their customer satisfaction scores decreased because customers felt like they were just being shelved off. They felt like they weren't as, as important. However, when they introduced uh, Ava here, who you can see um, behind the screen here, as an artificial human, to answer these escalated queries. If you start with the chatbot, you can escalate up to Ava. Their customer satisfaction scores increased again because people felt like they were having that human connection. Because Ava looks like, an, looks like a human, she feels like a human when you're engaging with her. Now, I've taken up a lot of time. So what I want to do is introduce um, our co-founder and Chief Business Officer, Greg Cross, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about our business model and some of the research we're doing and our vision. Thank you. Thanks, Owen. Cool. Um, good morning. Um, and uh, thanks for um, doing such a great job of introducing who we are and some of what our technology is going to mean for the future and the way in which we interact with machines. So my job this morning is to talk um, rather than about our solutions and our, a little bit about our technology, but a bit about our business and how we're going about constructing uh, a technology company um, in this fourth industrial revolution and, and, and how we're going about it. So Soul Machines is a spin out from the University of Auckland. Um, it's very different to a lot of tech companies in many parts of the world, and certainly in this part of the world, it is based on very deep research and very deep science. So Dr. Mark Sager, my co-founder, my business partner, um, uh, Academy Award winner. Um, um, we have a, a team today of about 100 people, um, four professors, 17 PhDs, neuroscientists, psychologists, uh, physiologists, artists, you know, who, who have been in the, in the Hollywood industry. So it's an incredibly diverse range of people as we have taken Soul Machines from a, a, an initial research team of 11 people and built it into a team of about a, 100 people over the last two and a half years. Uh, we're backed by some of the smartest AI investors uh, on the planet. Uh, uh, Horizons Ventures, um, part of the Lee Kai Shin Foundation out of Hong Kong. Selena Chow, she backed the team that built Siri. And when they left Apple uh, and went to, be, to, to create Viv, she backed that team again. She backed, um, she backed the Deep Mind finder, uh, founders, Demise and Mustafa, when they s spun what was Deep Mind out of Cambridge University. Um, it's sub subsequently gone on to um, be acquired by Google. So these are, these are some of the things that have become important ingredients in terms of the way in which we are approaching uh, the future uh, of our world. We operate globally, um, we have done from day one, to raise the sort of capital that I need to fund this business, it means I need to fund it offshore. So most of our clients are on the international stage. Our business development team, uh, our customer facing teams are all head, headquartered out of uh, North America. Uh, we are targeting and talking to some of the leading CEOs in the world, some of the leading innovators and thinkers in a wide range of categories, finance and banking, with, um, the, with people like the Royal Bank of Scotland, ANZ Bank here, ABC Bank, uh, one of the leading fintech banks in the Middle East. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, Hillary talked about, Autodesk in the tech industry, IBM and Google in the tech industry. So these are some of the things that we have to um, be very, very focused on as we move forward in the future. We have big projects underway at the moment in both Japan and China. Yes, China. Um, in this world of artificial intelligence, there are two superpowers. 
um, America, everybody would pick that, um, but also China. And if anybody wants to think about China and the world of AI, um, there is a manifesto that was written by the Chinese government, and they basically see world domination via artificial intelligence. Who's the biggest ride-sharing company in the world? Most people would say Uber. Wrong. It's Didi. Uh, Didi is the Chinese equivalent. Um, Didi ran, um, actually ended up, I think, acquiring Uber's business in China. Didi actually has access to data in China that Uber can only ever dream about um, because of the close collaboration between the Chinese government and some of the big um, organizations go on in, in there. Um, the face of our technology are our amazing digital humans, and you may have recognized Ava from Autodesk is actually Shashila Takao, a professional actress here in New Zealand. She's appeared on a number of drama shows here. Um, she actually makes more money as for, to license her digital human um, or the, her, her likeness as a digital human um, to Autodesk, and she probably makes um, um, being a, uh, an actress um, here in New Zealand. Um, so we've had to think about how we are going to construct our business models. So today we have a, a probably about 20 of these digital humans, digital employees working in different parts of the world, but having tens of thousands of conversations a month. You know, we look forward into the future and we see thousands of digital employees having millions of conversations per month. And within the period of five to 10 years, um, we each, each and every one of you, could potentially have a digital version of yourself. You may, you know, like Jeremy, want to de-age himself by, you know, 10 years uh, and go back in time, maybe, um, um, and, and train that digital human to go out in the world and do stuff uh, for you. So we see in the future you know, literally millions of these digital humans having billions of conversations. So we're constructing our business model, not based on, you know, building digital humans. That technology which we built, we're going to give away. You know, we'll monetize our technology on a per conversation uh, basis, you know, a uh, per interaction basis. Mercedes-Benz is one of our customers. Imagine if I could go to, um, Formula One started last weekend, I can make a digital Lewis Hamilton. Who wouldn't like, you know, if you're a Mercedes-Benz fan, who wouldn't like Lewis Hamilton to sell them their next Mercedes-Benz? How many interactions would that generate and would that create? Um, so this is the way in which we think about our world. Now, you know, we, we've, we've heard about what AI isn't and what it does really badly um, and through a really good presentation earlier this morning. And we're not focused on the machine learning stuff. We're starting to read now that a lot of the machine learning stuff was actually invented 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and the big difference for AI today is the amount of data that exists in the world and the amount of data we can use to train it you know, sometimes well and sometimes incredibly badly. What we are focused on as a company is the next level of artificial intelligence. What makes it more human? Now, as human beings, we're not data processing engines. We're not data storage machines. Um, we don't run by algorithms. Um, so none of that is relevant to the way in which we will get from where we are today with artificial intelligence to a world of the future which you know, we refer to as artificial general intelligence. We partner with the guys at Singularity University. Ray Kurzweil has this vision that says, you know, at some point, um, machines will be smarter than us. Well, we, don't, we haven't even begun to figure out how that starts to happen. But the area of artificial intelligence that intrigues Mark and the scientists at our organization is this concept we call experiential learning. So how do we learn as human beings? We learn through experience. So imagine a world of the future, which Hillary touched on, where digital humans that are having millions of interactions on a daily basis, learning from every single one of those interactions. That is experiential learning. That is what will provide them with the context 
to be much more helpful for us in the future. So a lot of what we hear about artificial intelligence today is man versus machine. So that's the context. Um, the guys at DeepMind, um, you know, they, I mean, last year they um, invented um, a type of AI, narrow intelligence, that could beat the best players of Go in the world, the most complex strategy game um, that people know about. Um, a, a, about a month ago, we started to hear stories that they've invented a, a platform which enables their deep learning machines to beat humans and some of the top professional gamers at StarCraft. Once again, very, very narrow field uh, of intelligence. So it's this context of man versus machine. But we live in an era where, as human beings, we're going to spend more and more of our time interacting with machines. So our view of this world is, wouldn't it be great if these machines um, were actually more like us? Wouldn't it be great if we could find ways that these machines don't just compete with us, or they don't even compete with us, but ways in which they can collaborate with us and cooperate with us. What sorts of problems can we solve in the world um, if these machines can interact with us in a much, more, in, in a much better way? So um, we have built a digital brain. As best we know, this is the only digital brain in the world. Um, there are a, a lot of complexities, as you'd imagine, to um, the way in which a digital brain works. Hillary explains something of the way in which we mimic the emotional system that we have. That's our limbic system. I mean, in simplistic neuroscience, we have three control systems in our brain. Our reptile brain, or our brainstem, which is our reaction or res immediate response system. So our gut brain, we have our limbic system, which has our emotional response system, the, the things when we get our brain chemistry all um, 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 telling us what to do, when to smile, when to get, you know, how, how we should look when we get stressed. Um, you know, our face tells a thousand words. And then we have our cortex brain, um, you know, our rational brain. So our heart, sorry, our gut, our heart, and our, and, and our head, um, uh, three parts of our brain. And, these are concepts behind um, the models um, that we've created um, to build these hyper-lifelike digital humans. It takes about three months if you're going to base it on the likeness of a real person um, today. We've just finished um, building our first uh, celebrity, um, which we'll launch um, uh, in, in a couple of months' time now. Um, and that took uh, it's about a three-month process to build them. We can now actually, we have this concept of digital DNA. So um, the more digital humans we built, and we built about 30 of these at the moment, we can actually start blending these features together to create what I call synthetic digital humans. So, you know, think of a world of the future where you're not having just one digital human represent your brand. You can, you know, if you, you can have multiple digital humans. The way in which you converse with a 50-year-old lawyer is very different to the way you converse with a 20-year-old college kid. Uh, the way in which you talk to somebody, you know, I mean, clearly there's language. Um, we've got a big prog project we're, we're doing at the moment with Procter & Gamble that gets rolled out in Japan, China, and America uh, later this year. Um, going to need to be able to speak uh, different languages. So these are all of the ways in which we build out um, and complete our technology. You know, we've heard today how artificial intelligence isn't that smart, really, and we don't really have to be quite so worried about um, the Terminator robots coming along to steal our jobs, kill us all, and rule over us quite yet. Um, because we're needing to build out more and more sophisticated use cases. Conversational content for digital humans and for chatbots, guess what? All of that conversational content today is created by real human beings. You know, we're on the verge of some of the next breakthroughs, which will take us from you know, the NLP engines that chatbots use today to the NLG engines, which enable us to to generate conversational content from data. That sort of technology is going to start to roll out in the next 12 to 18 months. So as time progresses, we're going to see the use cases get exponentially 
more personalized and more specialized. You know, what drives Ross McEwen, you know, a Kiwi running the Royal Bank of Scotland in the UK, is, you know, how is he going to be relevant as, an, as a bank in 10 years' time when we already know, based on blockchain technologies becoming available, that we're not going to need a bank to exchange value between ourselves in the future. You know, um, the privacy data, the personal financial data that we have, we now have ownership of that. We can, you know, under open banking regulations, we can pick up our banking data and take it over here if we want it, if we want to. So the ownership of us that our banks have had is going to go away. So, you know, Ross has this view of his future, of his bank's future, where he can provide highly specialized financial advice. So maybe it's going to be three years' time, maybe it's going to be five years' time, maybe it's going to be 10 years' time. But the world of his future, the customer experience world of his future, is being able to provide a financial companion that you can interact with, ask questions of, and get service from 24 by 7 in the way in which you want it. Um, we're doing some incredibly fun stuff. Um, we're bringing Vincent van Gogh back to life. Why? Because we want to see how people feel about interacting with somebody that's been dead for a very, very long time. Um, then, uh, we're entering a whole new era of digital um, sponsorship. Icons of the 20th century are getting near the end of their natural life. We can immortalize them and able to carry their legacies forward into the future. In our lifetime, we will have a choice of whether we want to create a digital version of ourselves to talk to our great, great, great grandchildren in the future. Thank you very much. So thanks, thanks so much, uh, Greg and Hilary. Well, there's a lot there. So, um, kind of slightly esoteric one uh, first for you, Greg. So, there's this thing called the human bullshit detector, which is quite strong. But there's also this thing that humans do. You know, when we watch a movie, uh, what's it called? It's called the willing suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. You know something isn't true, but you kind of like forget about it. So how do these human viewing patterns, trying to work out what's real in the world, what's authentic, versus kind of being okay with it not, how do you need to understand that? And how do humans actually relate kind of emotionally to this? Do they love it as much as you do? Or yeah. are they just going, oh, well, it's better than you know, waiting on the phone for five minutes? Um, yeah, I mean, really, really good question. Um, and, you know, to be honest, it's something we're still learning about. You know, we don't know what we don't know. Are the experiences we see in one industry going to be relevant to another industry? Are the experiences in a customer service use case versus a HR or recruitment use case going to be the same? He, 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 there's a couple of things that are really, really important. I mean, one, you have to be upfront with people and tell them that they are talking to a digital human. So, you know, we're not trying to convince people that they're talking to a real person. The second thing um, it comes down to is can they, you know, do people actually form an emotional connection with this digital human that, that, um, on the screen? What we are seeing, you know, very strongly from the data that we have is yes, people are forming an emotional connection. We, for we form those connections on a face-to-face -face basis. And we don't form those connections with a voice assistant like a Siri or an Alexa, for an example. So, yeah, we are seeing some pretty strong data that, you know, if you um, are getting emotional responses from, you know, a highly lifelike, a high fidelity digital human on a screen, you are going to form an, emo an emotional connection to, to them. And can I get away with bad human behaviour? If I'm really mean to it and if it's doing what Hillary says about optimising my happiness and keeps on smiling at me, how, how does it kind of, does it try and make me a better human or does it just not care <laughs> yeah. and just keep yeah. on just yeah. being so nice back to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, digital humans are programmed. So, um, you know, they, are, they operate within the parameters we give them. So as human beings, as real human beings, we are multifaceted. We have different per parts of our personality that come out depending on who we're interacting with. With a digital human, they have one role in life. You know, they're a customer service agent. So that means 
Um, they don't have the ability to express negative emotions, get angry, get, show disgust, uh, show contempt. I mean, those, are, those emotions don't exist. When we create, work with our customers to create the personalities behind these digital humans, I mean, they want those digital personalities to embody the brands that they represent in the same way that they want the real employees they put to work to do that, that sort of thing. So, um, so these are some, you know, so we, we actually have to create a digital personality, digital conversational content, which is relevant um, to the brand. Um, digital humans can fail. Um, you know, they can fail for one of three reasons. So we, we build um, user experiences we call elegant failure. Um, I don't understand you. So that's generally when the, the system that converts speech into text to query the AI database doesn't understand your accent. Um, I don't know um, about what you're asking me. I mean, so they have limitations to their knowledge base. If you haven't given it some of that knowledge about your new products and service, they might, might not be able to answer that question. And they don't want to talk about it. So, you know, <laughs> if you go and ask an inappropriate question, I mean, and these are things that are happening today. Jamie from ANZ Bank, everybody here can go to anz.co.nz um, backslash help and you could end up having a conversation with Jamie, who's their digital employee. People call up and swear at Jamie. Um, and so our customers are already having to think about these things. Yeah. And uh, Hilary, a bit about yourself. So you're fairly new into Soul mm -hmm. Machines, but you've got a super strong background with some of the best digital companies in the world. So why would you leave that trajectory that you're on to join this path? I'd like you to meet Greg. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg and I go back 20-something years, and I was recently with, with Google. Um, I've been with Microsoft before then. And I was at a point in my career where it's, it's stay in New Zealand and not go any further with Google or, or move overseas. So I was heading off overseas. Had lunch with Greg, we had a conversation about what it would mean to stay in New Zealand. Now, to leave Google is a, is a relatively big deal. The reason why I did this is I believed so much in what Soul Machines were doing, not because I feel that a bank needs another customer service agent necessarily, but what I talked about earlier on was around what, what got me excited was we can take education to indigenous populations that don't necessarily have it. We can take healthcare, we can scale it out to them, not just in New Zealand, but on a global scale. So that's the stuff that got me excited. And when I thought I can either move to the US and, and keep selling Google, or I can actually make a difference in the world uh, to, to various populations of people that don't have access to some of these things that we just take for granted because we happen to live in a city, we happen to have money. So that sense of what's purpose, uh, of, of what's possible, that, that purpose behind the business and how it can get directed, is that something which is a bit of a work in progress or are you crystal clear about why Soul Machine exists and how it can have some sort of social impact as yeah. opposed to just commercial impact? Absolutely crystal clear. I mean, and you have to. And and you know, AI is not something that any one of you can afford to ignore, because there are many challenges. Um, here in Auckland, we couldn't even introduce something as simple as a scooter um, to our streets without <laughs> without creating massive debate and concern on a whole bunch of different issues. Now, AI is incredibly more complex than that. So, you know, if our elected officials can't get the scooter conundrum right, how are they going to get the AI thing right? They're only going to be able to do that if we all get involved in the conversation. So, you know, the ethics of AI is going to be incredibly important. Um, you know, our focus and the value that we have is, you know, Hillary talked about this concept of the democratisation of personal service and specialised knowledge. And that is no more relevant in areas of healthcare and education. When I grew up, when Mark and I grew up as kids, here in New Zealand, every kid in New Zealand got the same healthcare and every kid in New Zealand got the same education no matter where you lived. Unless you are rich, unless you are white, unless you live in a major city and you can, and you can tick two out of those three boxes, you are screwed. You are not going to get the same level of health care. You're not going to get the same level of education. And, I, and that can be applied to any, literally any country in the world. Um, those are the things in terms of what we do that drive Mark and I in terms of the potential for this technology. Um, that's why we love working with guys like, da like Dr. Lance O'Sullivan, who is championing how do we deliver you know, health care services to remote communities where GPs don't want to even live anymore. 
And thinking about other companies you've worked with and where you are now, so thinking about that kind of force for good versus what you know Google's don't do evil type thing, how can you and other people within the organisation uh, have a sense of ownership over that? How can you actually govern how this technology is used? Do you just give it to your customers? Is it about choosing the customers? Is it about the constraints you put on it? Is it about how you monitor it? I mean, what stuff can you actually do mm -hmm. so the reason you joined can eventually get legs and this just not be about Lewis Hamilton selling you a car or you know, what other commercial outcome? I'd say there's two halves to that. And the first half is we don't work with every customer that wants to work with us. We've got certain guidelines and certain, as Greg was saying, around ethics as well, that if there's a company that comes to us that wants to do, you can imagine some of the different use cases, we're not interested. We don't want to, so we're not out there just to make money. It, it does help in raising capital, but we're not out there just to make money. We're out there to make this difference in humanity. So that's part of it. So we do target the right type of customers, and we are looking for customers that, that share our vision and what we want to do. The other part of it, and the other half that I get to do, is I get to bounce into Greg's office and go, hey, I just spoke to this guy that wants to do this amazing stuff for, for mental health or for this or for that. What do you think about that? And I know the answer because that's why I joined the company, because he and Mark have this, the same passion and the same goal. So, and then it's about how do we formulate this so that it makes sense for the, and make sure that we can deliver on what the people want us to do. Um, and then we've got some side projects that we can do where we can start to enable change and start to make a difference. Um, and then the more customer service agents we sell to banks, the more time we can spend on, on some of these other pieces as well. At least for me, Greg can spend as much time on what he wants. <laughs> So, so what is the decision process like about who you do and don't work with? You know, if you've got this amazing hospital wanting to live a virtual, you know, mm -hmm. health through, I don't know, a thousand branches in India or something versus this incredible project, you've got a hundred people, which is big for New Zealand and tiny compared to Google, who I'm sure are trying to do their own vision. How do you actually prioritise and make choices between the commercial and the social? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's hard. Um, um, you know, I mean, we are a commercial organisation. We're venture funded. Um, you know, we, you know, um, our, I, I can fund my sales and customer service and business development team out of cash flows. I certainly can't fund the, the you know, 80 researchers and scientists out of cash flow. So, we have to raise venture capital. We raise, you know, I mean, I'm in the middle of raising 50 million dollars. Um, we are three years old as a company. So. Um, that's a lot of money, so that means we have to be hitting some commercial milestones and some commercial imperatives. But we also need to be able to demonstrate to potential investors the opportunity for scale. And you know, areas like healthcare um, have enormous opportunity for scale. Um, there are amazing innovative companies out there looking at how they solve scale in this problem. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Um, in China, um, there's a company called Ping An Good Doctor. Um, uh, if you don't know about it, go Google it, go have a look at it. They have done 200 million online health consultations already. It is the future of healthcare. It's an amazing company. I mean, they just don't have enough doctors. They never will have enough doctors in China. So they are doing all of the frontline consultation you know, using AI-based systems and platforms which magnify um, the, amount, the number of customer interactions a doctor can have a day because a doctor is doing peer review of the initial consultation, the initial screening. So a doctor in real life might see, what, 20 or 30 patients in a day. Uh, a doctor working off the, good, uh, off the good Dr. Ping An platform might be able to review two to 3,000 patients per day. So these are the types of scale problems that we get to, to look at. Um, um, and, and say, you know, how does this make a difference in the world that we operate today? How will this help solve some of the problems of the future? I mean, the good news is there's, a, there's you know, as many people who are out there trying to make money out of AI, there are a lot of people out there trying to figure out how it solves some pretty fundamental problems mm -hmm. in the world. Hilary and Greg, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.